So we've been looking at si molesto and we've reached the fifth measure where we hear the melody is and the harmony together. So we have C minor and then we have C and E rather than C and E flat. So what chord does that look like? C major. Looks like a C major chord. Now in the melody we have which rhythmically is a bit messy on purpose, I would like to say, <laughs> with the harmony. Now the harmony divides the measure in two parts. So what notes do we have there and there? A whole note is the whole measure. So there we have a half note. A half note. We have two sets of half notes. C minor is a half note. C major is a half note. But on the melody, we're playing a quarter note, a quarter note and a half, and then a quarter note and a half. So you get this rhythmic effect. And this pattern of a quarter note and then a quarter note and a half and then another quarter note and a half is like the rhythm 3-3-2 three, three, that we saw only backwards. Now 3-3-2 three, three, belongs to this genre. No, or is a big part of this genre. It's not exclusive to this genre. And having it backwards, again, kind of alludes to the, the meaning or the, the general feeling of the song of uncomfortable inverted fitting in fitting back in, but from memory rather than experience. There was no experience to be had in a closed city. A backwards 3-3-2 three, three, in Buenos Aires. It's, it's 2-3-3 three, three, rather than 3-3-2. Three, three, and then if you look at the overlap between those notes and the harmony, we have the C minor chord. So there we have the C in the melody agreeing with the harmony well. Then going to a B, and then to a B flat. Harmony is trying to find itself as we fall in half steps. Trying to establish itself in this uh, messy or spooky, as you described it, section. As if we're trying to find the note that best fits with the changing harmony. And at the same time, the rhythm is equally as confused, no? A backwards 3-3-2 three, three, further interfered with by the division of the measure into two equal parts by the harmony. The B-flat we finish with whilst we're playing the C major chord. Together with that chord creates a new chord. A C7 chord. Now a C7 chord, or a 7 chord generally, just puts another layer on our, on our tower of numbers, no? So our triad chords, minor chords, major chords, diminished chords, are built of 1, 3 and 5. Some version of A, C, E, for example, or C, E, G, or B, D, F. Always skipping a letter or a number. 1, 3, 5. 7, that's the 7th. There's different types of 7 chord, but the most common seventh chord is built on the major chord but with a minor seventh so this would be c e g with the g missing and then the seventh b flat so seven chords are chords with four notes although of course we don't necessarily need to play them all so from this part the move from b to b flat which is quite dissonant although somehow still justifiable we know something has gone slightly wrong then we have the consequence of that of what went wrong, the social awkwardness, the bit of being stuck in the corridor trying to step around or over one another. There's something different rhythmically happening with the chords here. The chord now has a different pattern for those two measures. So this is called arrastre in tango, which means dragging. Now, I chose these different tango-y styles of playing the chords kind of randomly when I was looking at the chord progression, but this decision about the chord affected the melody. It's clear to hear the similarity between the two and thus how they complement each other. How can they not if one inspired the other? <laughs> 
So what achieves this feeling of, you know, trying to get past each other in the corridor? For the harmony on the first measure there, we have F and A flat in the first measure. And in the melody, we have C, B, C, F. What chord might F and A flat be? F minor. Well done. And what is the fifth of F? The missing fifth? C. C. So that would justify this note in the melody, no? And make the B, the C molesto, the B, the passing note. Because we have C, B, C, F. No? So C and F are from the chord, and the bothersome B is the passing note. And then in the next measure, we have D and F in the harmony, and in the melody, C, B, C, E flat. So again, on this part, where we have the D and the F, the B, the B is part of the harmony. So what chord do we have? If we have D, F and B? B minor, or B diminished even. B diminished, no. So now, the B that was a passing note is now part of the harmony. What are the C and the E doing here? Creating some harmonic ambiguity, maybe. So with this repetition, This, the B, the bothersome B, changes its role. Now in the first part it's like a passing note and in the second measure it's part of the chord. This is our seventh measure. The next one wraps up the whole theme. So the theme lasts for eight measures. As mentioned, when it comes to macro structure, or why the structure of music, we tend to find fours and of course multiples of fours, like eight, twelve, sixteen. Anything you notice there? Ah, right. 3-3-2. Three, 3-3-2 three, two. Three, three, two rhythm. So we had that in the fifth measure going backwards, and now we have it in the eighth measure going forwards, how it does go. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So you identified this already. What chord is this? Is that the C minor again? That's the C minor chord, no. This is a G. No, completing the chord. So when we do this, we're playing a G and an A flat. We know we have A flat in C minor, no, that's of the key. We have B, E and A flat in C minor. What is A flat in the context of C minor? What scale degree is it? Submedian. So here we have a minor key, we're in C minor. So the submedian, the A flat, is going to bring in some major vibes, vibes from outside of the key quality, because we have a major third from A flat to C, from the submedian to the second tonic. So it brings in a little bit, tiny bit of major qualities. We come back to the tonic chord, no, but breaking the arastre rhythmic pattern and turning it into. And in these melodic phrases, we have something in common. We have something in common. Small movements of a half step away from a note is again something that's very typical of the genre. And so knowing that, consciously or otherwise, will be one of those factors that help influence your melody. So in this case, it was the rhythmic pattern I randomly chose for this measure and that typical half-step tonal movement of tango that came together to generate. As the composer, you're sometimes just the computer, putting things together. Both words, compose, compute, mean with putting. So again, that's something typical of the genre, no? something that gives it a little bit more of a tango feel. This for example. And then we return to the beginning of the theme, but an octave lower. What does that achieve, repeating it an octave lower? 
it'll make you feel calmer because it's lower. Because if it's going higher, it'll say you're shrieking. Mm. And if it's lower, it's like mellow. But what else happens when you go lower? What do you hear more of? Ah, okay. Um, you'll hear more overtones. You hear more overtones, more folds. And the more complicated things get, the more all folded up things get, the more dangerous they get, the more uncertain they get, the more potential for mishap there is. The more overtones you have, the more diminished fifths you're likely to find between them. So it feels a little bit different when we repeat it an octave lower. Not only that, but a repetition allows us to get more familiar with the whole theme so that we can more easily recognize how it's modified later on in the piece. different there because it leads on to a choral section that I'm not going to go into now. So we're going to focus on this, on just, on just this uh, melody and the repetition. So yeah, th did it feel different to you now? Yeah. How would you describe the difference in feeling? Uh, well, more sinister? Yeah, less playful, no? Like there's consequences to this. <laughs> <laughs> so apart from the, the choral bits, which are just kind of like... Sounds like the bit where Aya killed the Night King. <laughs> no, seriously, yeah. like, I think that's literally what happened. I've, I've tried to erase that from my memory. I, I, but, but that stuff happens when you compose. Like I wrote another melody and then I realised it's because I'd seen a video the night before of somebody playing the theme to Harry Potter on the buttons of a washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I composed. So it's not hard to appreciate how that is somehow similar to So anyway, there's two more repetitions of this. So two extra repetitions. So when you build a piece of music, when you just have a little bit of melody, you already have the whole song. All you have to do is explain it, unfold it. That's what explain means, literally, no? Unfold. You need to unfold it out there. You can unfold it in any manner of ways. But that's mostly what you're doing. So I was also inspired by this idea of mutation, no? Going back to somewhere after years, I was very well assimilated in my early 20s in Argentina. I never thought I was going to live anywhere else or have any other life. And, you know, trying to like plug back into that, but this idea of being mutated, like a diminished fifth, no? So in the next repetitions of the theme, all I've done is mutated it a little bit, but in a way that I've tried to make it feel that the original idea is trying to come through but is, is getting lost every time it's like copied and pasted. I don't know if I've um, achieved anything like that. So instead of at the beginning bit, for it's, there are very small differences, no? Now on the first run we go... Where on this run we go... Which is like how we ended the last bit, no? No, so stuff's getting jumbled up. Here, very small variation, instead of... So instead of... We now have... It's like we can't take the step now that before we had. That's what we played before, but now it's... It's like we can't take that step, no, in the awkward encounter in the corridor. That step that turned out to be a bit like a dance. Albeit an unintentional one. Now we're not even managing that in the awkwardness. 
Now that step is getting stuck. And now at the end bit, instead of we now have which is my favourite version of it. I like how that feels rhythmically. It's much more forceful now and it's almost like we're charging through the corridor otherwise we might not get through. Now we have a repetition of that, an octave below and then the last repetition things change a little bit more noticeably. So in this last variation of the melody, we don't jump straight to the bothersome B from G, I, F to B. This time, we go G, F, G, F sharp, G, F sharp, and then to B. So some of these characteristic uh, movements of just a half step that we've heard previously are now coming at the beginning of the theme. So this is by far the most important variation in the third run and it's a stark one forcing us to reevaluate the melody much more than the first variation of the theme did. In this way, this last variation acts like a conclusion, a result of the previous experience, the compromise you make with experience as we wrestle with how it changes us. Almost, I'm this now. Still the bothersome B but a little less imposing, a little more contextualised now. Has some dancing going on around it. And the bothersome B is also shorter here, lasting a measure rather than a measure and a half. Maybe the timelines of past and present are beginning to join in this last variation. Maybe this is our new theme. Maybe we should get used to it. A compromise between being oneself and forming part of a whole. We also get our groove back on in the corridor in this repetition. We're no longer stuck on the same note like in the previous repetition. We're moving again. It sounds like the original version of it, which was... Although it is a little different. Now we're playing... Instead of... We're moving a half step in the other direction now from the important notes to keep up the variation, but that's subtle. So the fact that we're dancing again might help this part sound more like part of a conclusion, no, a new melody. A new melody that we've managed to compromise. So that's the last repetition of the theme, and we've managed to create a whole piece of music repeating just eight measures of melody. Apart from the choral sections that I've not gotten into, of course, we have both variations of the original theme and repetitions in different octaves. These two resources are the principal ones we'll use in bulking out or unfolding, developing a melodic idea, changing the pitch of whole melodies or sections of melody and altering elements of the melody such that it feels different but still like the same song. And this is something you can do in line with a particular genre if you so wish. And before we finish, I can say a few words about the last two notes. So this here, from G to C, is a what? A, an ascending... The dominant of G. Subdominant. Perfect fourth. In the context of the key, we are going from the dominant to the tonic. And that's the typical ending of tango. So that's what people call... Chan Chan. <laughs> You'll be surprised in music to, to see how musicians speak about music in a much more informal way than we might have imagined. This is literally called Chan Chan, just in case you didn't know it was a tango. Mm -hmm.